Bergman. Hi, I'm Tom Off. This is Columbia Olympians one on one. Hi, Tom. Hey, Face. How you doing? It's been a while. Good. It's been a long time. <laughs> How are you doing? Excellent. Everything's going great. We're excited about the Olympics coming up this summer, of course, and uh, should be should be a great one that is going to finally take place. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for them, and I'm glad it's going to happen. So what were your experiences competing in rowing at Columbia? Well, let's see, I started, I actually started my sophomore year. So, uh, cause I was a transfer student uh, to Barnard and um, I had never rowed before, never even, I actually never even knew anything about rowing because I grew up in Alaska. So um, my mom was the one who kind of said, hey, why don't you try out for this sport? And I was like, okay, I'm 20 years old. I, I can't imagine trying a new sport at this age, but um, I went and to the first meeting. And then really after that, I was just kind of hooked. You know, um, I went from Alaska to New York City. So um, I was used to being on the water. And for me, it kind of felt a little bit like home to um, wake up every morning and be on the river and, you know, uh, have that experience of kind of like, like I said, like a little piece of home and all the people that I, you know, rode with throughout Columbia, those became my closest and best friends. And we did everything together and lived together and competed together. And some of us went on to start training for uh, the national team afterwards together. So, um, how about you? Yeah, so, you know, it's funny because your experiences are actually really similar to mine. So <laughs> I grew up playing baseball, uh, except that, you know, I didn't grow up in Alaska. I grew up uh, in New Jersey, and I played baseball and hockey. And I was actually supposed to play baseball at Columbia. Mm -hmm. And I showed up, and I had this silly notion that I wanted to be very uh, focused on academics. And I was nervous that if I, you know, tried out for the baseball team, I'd get, you know, too into it. And I wanted to take batting practice, you know, every free minute I had. And I thought that wouldn't be wise because I wanted to focus on academics. Well, I go to the physical, meet the guys for the baseball team, all great guys. But, you know, I was just thinking, you know, I'm going to get sucked into this too much. Head back to John Jay. I see an advertisement above the elevator. Try rowing. Uh, you know, a lot of people try for the first time in college and some make the Olympic team. And I thought that's interesting. So I went to the first meeting and, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was really great to meet the folks there. They sat me down on the erg and, uh, you know, I did like two minutes of a piece and, you know, was basically falling off the, the machine. The coach was saying, can you believe the varsity guys can do that for 20 minutes? And I thought, oh my God, I can't, I can't imagine. Um, but, you know, that, you know, that was sort of the start of it. And then I remember our first race, which was up at Yale, it was the fall regatta. Um, you know, I think we finished somewhere in the middle of the pack that, that day. But when we crossed the line, you know, I was so excited, had so much fun, and I was convinced we had won. I mean, for sure. I mean, it was just one of those great things. So it was, you know, it was, it was kind of a similar start. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it wound up being a really important thing, uh, you know, for me, uh, you know, after college and so forth. So um, similar to you too, you know, the, 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 the guys and the girls on the rowing team became my real social network in college. And, you know, we'd have practice typically, I rode with the heavyweights and we'd have practice in the afternoon. We'd always have dinner together. Um, you know, we'd drive up in the vans to practice. And so, we, you know, we all became very, very close. Uh, you know, we'd have team dinners before races, you know, Friday night dinners were always a big thing. And then we did stuff. We'd have an annual Super Bowl party, things like that, that carried on even well after college. So, you know, really great, great times. Um, it was really, you know, very much a family. Our uh, one of our traditions was having uh, banana pancakes at Tom's Diner after practice on Saturday. <laughs> and who was your coach? Was was Ed Hewitt still coaching at that time? The women no. or was Larry there? No, it was Mike. Oh, Mike Zimmer, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so how did you move on from rowing at Columbia to um, trying to make the national team? Well, you know, my, my whole journey is sort of characteristic of that, like, kid looking at, you know, an ad. 
and not really knowing, you know, what I want to do with this board or having it be formed. So, you know, when I was running at Columbia, you know, I still was, I was you know, very focused on academics also. I love the rowing. I love the social aspect of it. That was really my, my favorite part of it. Um, you know, I had teammates who were really into rowing. They were trying to submit their names to the national team system. I really didn't care much about it. You know, I mean, I just, I was, I was happy to go and do the practices. I love doing the races. And then as we got closer to the end of my college career, some of the guys who are really, you know, focused on rowing and trying to get invited to the national team camps said, you know, why don't you submit your scores and, you know, you, you do really well. So, you know, I did, and the coaches were interested. They came to watch me race, and then they invited me to a camp that summer, um, which, you know, I did well at the camp, and they invited me to go race in Europe. Uh, we raced in Lucerne and Henley, and that really, you know, kicked things off. And then, you know, I remember at that first camp, there was a, a questionnaire, and they asked us, how long do you plan on rowing in the national team system? Well, I had applied to law school. And I had already been accepted and I was, you know, I was supposed to go that fall. And I thought, well, you know, I'll probably do this summer, but then, you know, it's on to my career and, and you know, real life. And uh, so in answering that question, I thought, you know, I'll put probably, I'll put two to four years because, you know, just so I, it sort of shows I'm more interested, but I really was only thinking I was going to do it for one year. Did well that summer, got invited to all the camps, made the teams. And so like, you know, I rode for the U.S. team for 10 years after that. So, it was kind of a slow start and I got, you know, reeled into it very slowly, but it became, you know, one of the most obsessive things, uh, most important things in my life. How about for you? Uh, actually kind of similar. It was not on my radar really until my last year at Columbia. And then some of the other um, rowers starting, started submitting their scores, thinking about um, trying out for the team. And at the time, um, I think they were based in um, Princeton. And so a lot, uh, they were having um, uh, time, like time trials where you could go down and uh, do an ERG piece for the national team coaches. Um, and so some of the other women on the team were starting to do that. And, um, you know, I knew I wasn't um, going to be big enough to be a heavyweight rower. So, you know, it was like during that course of the year that we started to think about being lightweights and stuff like that. And, a couple of times we took um, the train down to Princeton and did some of these time trial kind of things on on the ERG with the coaches there and started submitting scores and things like that. And then as I got closer to graduation, I was kind of thinking, well, what am I going to do? Because um, I too was going to go to law school, and well, and I did, um, but I was I wanted to take some time off, you know, before I went on to law school. Um, and so a couple of the other women started telling me about this coach that was in DC that um, I believe you know very well. Um, and he was gonna do this camp for people who were kind of like prospective um, national team rowers. So we went down and um, spent the summer with Steve Peterson and he, <laughs> he coached us and kind of put together a quad and we started doing some of the races um you know of course we just got you know completely slammed by the national team rovers but it was just um we trained all summer we stayed together we did the races and it was just kind of like getting our feet wet and from there you know steve was really the one who said hey you should you should really stick with this and you should really um you know start sending in your scores and start um trying to do more. Um, so I spent a year with him there uh, training um, and before I actually moved on to the National Team Training Center in San Diego towards the end of 1999. But so I graduated in 98 and spent that entire year in DC training with Steve and some of the other um, prospective national team rowers. So does Steve row in the Olympics? I, I think he did. I, I, I feel like he might have rode with somebody named Tom, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so Steve, um, you know, it's funny. I, I didn't know that he was your coach. I had forgotten that actually. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I finished college. I think, um, you know, I graduated in 90 
and you know, I was rolling on the, the national team. And then um, I was I rode heavyweight in college, and then was rowing mostly lightweight after school, but still was doing some heavyweight races, you know, at the nationals, and you know, did some World Cup races as a heavyweight, the head of the Charles, of course. Um, and you know, in '92, the Olympics were in Barcelona, and so I was rowing in the pair. And my pair partner and I were, you know, the fastest uh, lightweight pair. And, you know, we, I, I look back on my career and that it was a big miss not to race the heavyweight trials to try to go to Barcelona. We were thinking that we wanted to race the lightweight eight that year at the world championships to, to win gold. But that was, you know, that, unfortunately that, you know, that didn't all pan out. And I, looking back on that, I wish that I had done that um, because I think we would have likely made the team in, in Barcelona, but then, you know, I went to law school um, and uh, graduated from Harvard in 94. And I was rowing with the Boston Rowing Center team up there in Boston, you know, all the way through. And that was tough, you know, especially first year, I'd wake up, have a 5 a.m. practice and a 5 p.m. practice. And I also was a teaching fellow for the under, undergraduate economics department at Harvard at the same time. So I was juggling a lot, but it was, you know, exciting and fun. And, um, and so, you know, uh, during that time, I started sculling, um, and then in 95, you know, went through some machinations with different potential partners, and Steve was, you know, kind of a free agent looking for a partner, and so he and I, you know, one race just got together and said, let's go do this. We did well, and then, you know, kept, kept it going. So we actually, you know, trained together all 95. We lived in Lithuania with the sculling team with Igor Grinko, who was the, you know, the former Soviet Union coach which was quite an experience. We had 14 Americans there, no one spoke English. You know, we had some, you know, some English television, Sky TV and CNN International, which would be on a 30 minute loop the entire day. But, you know, that was quite an experience living there. And that was in preparation for the world championships in 95. So, you know, Steve and I qualified for the Olympics at the 95 worlds, and then we raced together in, in 96. And, uh, had a, you know, had a great time. You know, we, unfortunately we didn't medal. And looking back on that, I think you know, we made one really key mistake, you know, and that was in our first race in the heat. Um, but, you know, we were, we were very good. And I think we had the ability to, you know, to win a medal. Our, our a boat that was a real rival for us was the Dutch. And we had raced them to like a fraction of a second um, many, many times leading up to the Olympics. Um, and they wound up winning the silver. Uh, and we had them in the heat. And so it was a little bit of a, you know, an unfortunate situation. But anyway, so did that. And then um, I went to work at a law firm in New York, Kurt Aswain and more after the 96 games. And I remember, um, you know, sitting with our coach, Mike Tatey, you know, who subsequently became the head coach of the, you know, the whole Olympic team and, and is again now. And just saying, you know, like, oh, I feel terrible about, you know, finishing, you know, this is the end of my rowing career. And I had mixed feelings about, you know, going to work and everything. And, um, you know, so it was, it was sort of a, a trying time for me. Um, and we can talk more about some of those difficult times and so forth later in the conversation, but, you know, so go, I went back to New York, started working and, you know, like I still had that itch, that bug. Um, and, you know, then they, then Mike started calling me, you know, about a year and a half later and some of the other teammates started calling me saying, Hey, think about coming back down. What do you think about the Sydney year? And so I started driving down to Princeton in the mornings before work. You know, the New York legal market starts a little later. So I could, you know, I'd, I'd leave at 5 a.m., do the practice, get back in the car by like 8 o'clock, and I'd be at my desk at 10. Uh, so it was, it was a long day, but it worked. Um, and so it was interesting because in the 96 season, Steve and I rode with um, Igor Greco that whole year. And then for 96, you know, I was sort of instrumental in trying to get a program uh, for the lightweights going in Princeton. And so Curtis Jordan and Mike Tatey were the, you know, were the two coaches there. And so at that time, Mike actually wanted me to row uh, with the sweep team for the four. And I, you know, I had said I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do the, the double. And then he did everything he could to try to get me to row with someone other than Steve, which is really interesting. So we we're trying a bunch of different partners and, and, you know, I just came to him, I said, look, we got to stop, you know, Steve and I are going to do this. So, you know, going through that Olympics, then coming back for Sydney, I remember, you know, on the, you know, the dock out of Princeton and, and Mike said, oh, so you're back. And I said, yeah, I'm back and excited for, you know, for this next go around. 
He said, so what boat are you going to row? You know, very sarcastically, like, you know, I made the choice last time. And I said, Mike, you tell me, whatever, whatever you want. So that, so, I, you know, I wound up making the team and I stroked the four. So he wanted me in the four, you know, in 96, but, you know, put me in the four in 2000. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I had, I guess, some similar experiences because I went to law school during the time that I was training as well. Um, I, the first team that I made was in 2000. Uh, I didn't go to Sydney, of course, but um, I made the world championship team. And that was in um, Croatia, which is a really, a really interesting experience. And I did the lightweight pair. Um, and so that was my first time making the team. And I don't, um, I'm trying to remember which coach we went with because, you know, Steve Peterson ended up coaching, um, still coaching me on and off, even after um, I went out to the Olympic Training Center in San Diego. Um, so I made, the I made the team that year. It was my first year out at the training center. I think I'd been there maybe six, six or eight months. Um, and then after that, I, I went to law school. Uh, so I was training here in Portland uh, by myself. Um, well, Lisa Schlenker was here as well, sure. who ended up being my partner at the Olympics. And so um, we trained a lot together um, in the mornings, but a lot of times I was just out there by myself, rowing my single early in the morning before going to, going to school. So I'd row and then I'd go to school. And then when there was a break, I'd go for like a long run um, because it wasn't really possible to row twice a day. Um, for me, uh, just because of the time commitment. Um, and then, you know, go back to night classes or study and things like that. So I did that for about two years while, you know, flying out to the East Coast to do, um, to do races and stuff in the summertime and train in the summertime out in Princeton. Um, and then after two years, I ended up taking a, um, a break from law school. You know, you can do as long as you do uh, all three years within five years, you can still graduate. But I just kind of felt like, you know, I wasn't doing either thing very well. Um, and my goal was to make the Olympic team. And so I uh, took a leave of absence from law school for two years and, and went back out to Princeton to train. Um, you know, and there was some movement back and forth. I I was in Princeton. I was in San Diego. There was a time I went to Australia to train, um, just kind of all over the place. I kind of took whatever opportunities I could um, and went where the rowing was. And, um, you know, there were times I was in Seattle as well. Um, but I just needed to kind of focus more on rowing if I was really going to make the team in 2004. And, and like you said, that it was a bumpy road. It was kind of all over the place in terms of who my partners were, which boat I was rowing. Um, I think I rode um, on the national team, I rode the lightweight pair in 2000, the lightweight quad in 2001, the lightweight double in 2002, and then back to the quad in 2003. So it was kind of, <laughs> kind of all over the place. You know, you kind of did what you could to try to get in the mix. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, did you would, have, so did you have a trials event? So, oh, 04, so Athens was your year. Athens was my year, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember, I don't remember, I wasn't in the double the year before. So I, I'm not, I don't remember off the top of my head whether we had qualified or not. I, I believe we did. We've qualified for the Olympics, but we had to, we still had to race in um, Cologne, Germany, uh, the same year as the Olympics to get a qualifying time or something along. No, the so you pro so we pro you know that's sort of strange because I mean normally I'd say that the, the women's lightweight double would qualify, but if you had to go to race in a in an event to get a time, that probably was a qualification event. Yeah, I, I feel I feel like it was. It's hard to know because the in two thousand and three, um, Lisa. Flanker and Rachel Anderson were in the double and I was in the quad that year. Um, and so we, in 2003 to 2004, there were four of us, four lightweights that were training out at the um, National Team Training Center, which was Lisa Schlanker, Rachel Anderson, myself, and uh, Sarah Hurst-Smith. So um, <clears throat> we spent the whole year training together. And I'm, 
you know, kind of towards the end, um, I didn't actually make the boat. Um, it, the boat was going to was set to be Lisa Schlanker and Rachel Anderson. And then we had um, the time trials and myself and Sarah Hurst ended up beating them uh, two out of three times. So um, Sarah and I were the ones who went to the qualifiers in Cologne, Germany. Um, and we qualified, but we knew we weren't that fast. Um, and that Lisa and I were gonna make the faster pair. So when we uh, came back, you know, there was a lot of switching around and trying to figure out what the fastest combination of people was. And then that's kind of how Lisa and I got paired up. Uh, okay, interesting. Yeah, so for us, yeah, so the, you know, the qualification system started in uh, 96. So prior to that, you know, up through Barcelona, there was no qualification. And the reason for that, you, you may or may not know, is that they had to limit, the IOC felt they had to limit the number of athletes and coaches. It was just getting too big. They couldn't house them at the Olympic uh, Village. So they capped it at 10,000 athletes. And so that's when they started the qualification system. And before that, you know, any country could submit an entry. Now you had to qualify. And they had, you know, set it up where for certain regions, they had preference, right? So like from South America, there were like two spots. From Asia, there were two spots, that kind of thing. And each of the events had a different number of spots. Like the single has the most, the eights have the, the least, the fewest. Um, so, uh, it's, and it's always the year before. And if you fail to qualify, you get it, you know, another chance that, that same year. So, you know, in 95, uh, you know, Steve and I did well enough to qualify. So we had the spot. And then, um, and so, but then the question is, you say is, you know, what you, the country has a spot. It's not those two people. So like with you and your partner, you got the spot, but then, you know, who, everything's up in the air in terms of, you know, what, what happened. So um, for us then coming back after getting the qualification spot, the question, you know, who was going to be the, the double? And, you know, ultimately, you know, that, that's where we had some early tension, you know, with Mike Tate in terms of setting our boat, but ultimately we had to go to race a trials event, right? So Steve and I, you know, did the trials and, you know, so we won the trials, which meant we were the U.S. team and, you know, the U.S. team had the spot because of the qualification that we had, you know, we, we won the, the, the prior year. Okay. And then for, you know, for the Sydney year, it was a little bit different. You technically still had to race the trials event. I mean, there's always a trials event. And if you don't have any, any other comers, it really becomes the camp selection boat is the one. We always had enough guys that we had multiple fours. So we had a trials event, but you know, the way the camp system works is the camp boat is going to wind up winning. So, you know, so I was in the, 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 you know, the camp boat, you know, the, the boat that the coaches put together, Curtis and Mike, uh, we raised the trials, but it was really, you know, um, not much of a, you know, a, a competitive thing. I mean, always great to win the trials, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the, the same thing as, you know, just showing up to a race where it was, you know, kind of a bunch of people not coordinated all racing each other the nature of the camp system changed that whole thing as you know yeah. um so and then what happened with us actually is interesting similarly so i came back i was doing you know for 90 the 97 season i really didn't do anything i just worked starting you know at the end of 97 i started exercising the rowing again rowing with the new york athletic club and then i went to the trials for the heavyweight double in 98 and really just to do it to kind of get back in we came in second and i was i was really surprised you know my partner was you know he was a decent rower and and we spent some good time together but did, did very well and it was after that i thought you know i'm, I'm still in pretty good shape and, and i'm going to try to try to go for this that's when i started getting the calls to come down to princeton so i wound up uh you know i, I requested you're know, talking about you know taking sabbatical and brains and so forth at that point I was working at Cravap as a, a young associate. I mean, and the schedule was insane at times. Yeah. Uh, but I went to the partners and I said, you know, they, they loved the fact that I was a rower and I had ro raced in, in Atlanta in 96. Um, and I said, so look, you know, the coaches and my teammates are asking me to come back for the 2000 season. This is early 99. And I would like to take a sabbatical. And they said, go for it. Great. So they were super supportive. So I went back, we raced the Worlds at 99, the qualification got at the Worlds in the four, and we got the spot, but that the team actually wound up being different in Sydney than the team that qualified in 99. Yeah, yeah, that's 
I mean, similar to us, we, you know, it was through the camp system and um, Lisa and Rachel are the ones that qualified, but we kept four people together throughout the 2003-2004 the, um, season to try to see which combination was the fastest. And it was a tough year. It was a long year because every time we went out on the water, um, you know, it was a competition. And, you know, to get those two spots uh, was really tough. And, you know, I, I, I was kind of coming from an outsider um, because they had, you know, they had um, really bonded as a, as a combination um, and really wanted to be together. So when, you know, so I kind of came in out from the outside and was like, had to kind of prove that I deserved to be in there. And so it just felt like every time I went out on the water for a year, it was like, I had to be, you know, at the top of my game to try to get myself in that position. Um, and it was, you know, disappointing when the line, you know, when kind of Tom Tierhart picked the lineup and it wasn't, I wasn't there. Um, and so, but I guess it kind of lit a fire under me because I was like, we're going to the trials and I had Sarah uh, Smith, or Sarah Hurst Smith with me and, you know, kind of we were the underdogs. And, you know, I said to her, I was like, we're gonna beat them. We're just gonna go out there and we're gonna beat them. <laughs> and she kind of looked at me like, uh, okay. And, and we did, and we beat them by quite a bit. Um, and so that was, that was pretty amazing, but, but we also, I mean, like I said, that Sarah and I were not the fastest combination of the four. Um, and so we went to the qualifiers in Germany and then we came back and we did a whole nother round of seat racing and, um, you know, training to come up with that last combination. And Lisa and I, um, I think actually ended up rowing together for less than like maybe six weeks. Yeah, we went to the Olympics. You know, that's always the hard part. And whenever anyone, anyone asks me about the American rowing system, that's a really tough thing to talk about, which is yeah. the, you know, the the lack of time together. So, you know, what happened in 96 with, you know, with Steve, we came back after the 95 season and, you know, we're rowing with different partners all the time. Mike was really, you know, pushing that, trying to find the fastest combination. And, you know, Steve was getting very frustrated with that, came to me and said, look, this is not smart. He's like, you know, and, and if we keep doing this, you know, he said, I just, he was getting very frustrated with it. So, you know, at some point, you know, I went to Mike and said, you know, we got to stop. You know, we think more time together is going to be helpful. I think that's particularly true in the smaller boats. In the eights, you know, you can get away from that a little bit more. But like, you know, the teams that we raced in 96, you know, the guys who won gold were two brothers. I mean, they've been rowing together forever. Uh, and many of the other, you know, doubles, you know, had a lot of experience rowing together. And that makes a huge, huge difference. So, you know, for us, um, we did have the 95 season. And then, you know, we rode together most of the 96 season other than the swapping around. But then, you know, in terms of my other Olympic experience in Sydney, the first race we had as our four together, like real race was the heat at the Olympics, the very yeah. first race. Yeah. And I think, you know, we had a really good team. You know, I think it was going to be difficult for us to win gold. The French were really excellent. And those guys, I think, th you know, three of four or four out of four had raced together, you know, four years before that in Atlanta. So, I mean, you know, the continuity was just, you know, really, really difficult to, to break into. And I think, you know, that's a little, it's a little difficult is the, the lack of time for the teams to bond and gel um, and, you know, in some sense, the, you know, the, our society and culture dictate that, right? You know, as Mike Taney would always say, his biggest competition as a coach was not Italy, Germany, what have you. It was Wall Street, right? And so getting people to, um, you know, focus on staying with the, you know, the, the, you know, training and so forth for multiple Olympics, which is what a lot of people from other countries do, uh, it was really, really difficult. So, you know, is keeping people in the system um, and, you know, having them stay together is really tough. I mean, the other thing is we, we lack the ability to race 
really high levels of competition because you know we're here and Europeans are, are in Europe racing all the time. So it was just it was just difficult in that in that respect. Um. So you you went to two different Olympics and um. You know what what were some of your good memories from both of those Olympics and maybe the Olympic Village and things like that. Um. I mean, there are just so many. I mean, so many great <laughs> things about it. You know, I mean, it was, it was just, it was wonderful. I, you know, the, the other thing I, um, you know, after the Sydney Olympics, I came back to work, just, you know, just a quick aside, and I'll answer that question. And, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the New York legal market was very, very slow. So one of my teammates from Sydney was, you know, trying to get me to come down. The thought was, we we're going to try to roll the heavy pair for Athens. And we did the first speed order, which was, you know, everybody, heavyweights and lightweights, and, and we won. Um, and, you know, the, the team that came in second had a guy named Brian Volpenheim who wound up stroking the eight in Athens that won the gold. Uh, like two weeks, maybe two or three weeks after that speed order, I went snowboarding and ruptured my spleen and had to have emergency surgery. And so that, that put the kibosh on the plans to go to, you know, to the Athens games. Um, so I, I look back on that, and that was sort of disappointing. But in any case, um, you know, so in uh, in Sydney, we made the final, which was, you know, really, really great. You know, we bumped the reigning world champion Austrians in the semifinal. We, you know, we, we finished ahead of them, so they didn't make the final. So that was, you know, that was really, uh, you know, a great thing for me when I look back on the career, on my, my Olympic career. Um, but you know, like the, the whole thing, uh, the whole experience, I mean, the training, there were times where I sort of said the same thing, like, this is really hard. What am I doing to myself? Um, you know, it was very challenging at times, but, um, you know, it was super rewarding. I had, you know, in my hometown in New Jersey, they had a parade for me, you know, after 96 and then again, after, you know, after 2000. So that was, you know, sort of unique and fun. Um, you know, making the final in Sydney was, you know, was a, an amazing experience. Um, I wish we had made the final in, you know, in, in 96. And, you know, there were a couple things that I think we, we sort of mentally, you know, we just, we put our focus in the wrong area, but, you know, you know, not to get into too much of the details on that, but, um, you know, I love the, you know, going to the opening ceremonies was just fantastic. I'll never forget, um, queuing up going into the you know the opening ceremonies we had the whole team had to walk up this big ramp and you'd crest the ramp and there was the olympic stadium you know with a hundred thousand people and it was really funny and cute like you know the americans you know the, everyone would sort of get to the top and then they would pause you know, right so you'd let a little space go in front of you like a couple of feet so the cameras could focus on you as you're entering in the stadium and walking down that ramp um, i also remember you know, getting ready to go to the opening ceremonies in the Olympic Village and, you know, everyone lived in, in the houses. Um, this is more in Sydney. Um, I remember, you know, you'd see the swimmers who would be hanging out there, but they never went because their, their races were the very next day. And that was always some tension, right? Do you go to the, the opening ceremonies or do you not go because of the proximity of the first race? You know, I went to both opening ceremonies, but you know, everybody was out in the, you know, the Olympic Village dressed in their marching uh, outfits, taking photos. You know, we'd have different group photos, like, you know, get a group of, you know, Columbia people, you know, get it, you know, all different groups would get together to take photos. Um, and that, you know, that was certainly a, a really memorable experience, the whole opening ceremonies, you know, everything about it leading up to it. And I don't know about you guys in, in, 90, in, in 2004, but for 96 and 2000, I think, in fact, no, I know for Athens, you guys had your venue away from the Olympic Village. What we would do is we would, you know, we'd go in to the Olympic Village for the night of opening ceremonies. And then the next morning, we would go back out closer to the venue and we'd stay at some sort of hotel. But, you know, that time at the Olympic Village was just fantastic. I remember one tough thing was the night of the opening ceremonies in Atlanta, we didn't get back to our room until like 3 a.m which was really, really tough. And I mean, you know, you're in a cycle where, you know, you're trying to, to rest yourself as much as you possibly can for the weeks, maybe months leading up to the event. So basically you're just rowing or you're resting yeah. and you're going to bed at like 10 o'clock or earlier, you know? 
And so to be walking around so much, you know, during open summers on your feet and then get back, you know, to, you know, go to sleep at 3 a.m. That was sort of like it could have took you off, off the cycle and so it was tough. How about you as far as, you know, your well, unique experience? Um, we were kind of in the position of the swimmers. Uh, so I didn't actually get to go to the opening ceremonies because our venue was actually quite far from the um, Olympic Village. It was a couple hours. Um, and so we had condos out there where we were all staying, all the rowers were staying out there. Um, but to be able to go to the opening ceremonies, it was like a several hour drive and our event started the next day. And so um, it was kind of a decision that was made as a team that we weren't gonna go. Um, we actually watched it on a big screen TV and we dressed up in our opening ceremonies outfits. Uh, so, I mean, that was in a way very special, like, of course, we would have wanted to go and to be part of the opening ceremonies, um, but it just, it wasn't really possible because we were, you know, your focus is on your event, like you're there to compete and be in your event and you need to do what you need to do to be rested and ready to go. And so it was disappointing to miss that. But like I said, we kind of made the best of it by dressing up in our, in our um, outfits and putting it on the screen. And we ate dinner on, it was kind of a pool deck. So we had dinner on the pool deck and the screen was there and we watched it all together and took pictures in our, in our um, uniforms and things like that. Um, but I think, so we did go to the closing ceremonies and, and that was just an amazing experience. Um, nothing like it in the world. Like you just can't describe it walking out into that stadium and seeing the number of people that are there and the cheering and the noise and the lights and um, all the people, you know. Um, in the closing ceremonies, you don't go in necessarily as a, as a country you kind of all, we all kind of went in together. So we were, you know, mixed up with all the different countries and all the different athletes. And, um, and it was just, it was just amazing. Uh, you know, overwhelming I mean, in a sense. Yeah, you know? no, for sure. For sure. The, the, the thing with the opening, I found it was, you know, the being in the Olympic village leading up to the opening Mm -hmm. And then, you know, kind of starting that whole process was a, it was a unique time to meet and then spend time with other athletes, you know, United States athletes. Mm -hmm. And so that was, you know, that was really fun. So we, you know, the rowers and the tennis team were all, always for some reason sort of, you know, scheduled close to each other, maybe alphabetically, I don't know. But, you know, we, we had, a, and the basketball players, so as well it was it was a great opportunity to socialize and meet those folks um you know we spent a good amount of time in the sydney year with serena williams and venus williams you know marching in and then you know standing on the you know uh, on the grounds as the the opening was happening um so that was kind of a unique thing as well but you know it was a really difficult choice and, and i think that you know if i had done that third games i might not have done the opening but it was, you know, it was a really tough decision to, to go. We had an extra day to recuperate, but I can tell you for sure, my legs felt walking around and, you know, I was really tired. I mean, for sure that was, you know, physically it was, it was draining. Yes. Well, and especially for lightweights, um, when you're trying to make weight and you really just have to stay off your feet and you have to be either lying down or exercising. <laughs> so yeah. one or the other. Um, you know, so I, I don't know what your experience with making weight was, but, you know, that was always kind of part of our focus. And we had kind of um, isolated. We were in Bulgaria for two weeks, and then we were a week in, um, in Greece before the actual Olympics started. But, um, yeah, that I, I understand that um, exhaustion that you're at right there. You know, one of the other, you know, unique and memorable experiences for me was racing the heat in Atlanta. Uh -huh. You know, there was a crowd of 80,000 people. And I remember coming into the stretch, you know, so we were racing against our, our rivals, the Dutch. And it was, you know, really close last thousand meters. And I could physically feel this, this you know, the yelling from the stands, 80,000 people in my chest. I mean, as we're racing, it was really amazing. 
Yeah, you, I mean, the course is so long, it's 2000 meters, but when you start to get into the last 750 meters, that's when you start hearing it. And by the time you're closer to the finish line, it's just like a roar, you know, it's just, you can just hear it kind of vibrating. It was, it was, that was a pretty amazing experience as well. And just, especially in Atlanta with the, you know, the hometown American crowd, right? So yes. anytime there was an American boat, they would just, they would just go crazy. Yeah. Um, how about um, any perks that you experienced at the <laughs> Olympian? What, you know, what sort of, you know, good, you know, perks or anecdotes do you have? No, I was kind of thinking about that earlier. And some of the things I remember from the Olympic Village, because we actually um, got the second week at the Olympic Village and we were done competing. So we kind of got to, um, you know, all the pressure was off. So we kind of got to do what we wanted to and experience what we wanted to. And I, I remember a few things, like I remember um, being able to get, they, they allowed you to get your hair cut. They had like this huge salon and you could go and get your hair cut by these like great um, beauticians. And I remember being so excited to do that and going to the um, the dining hall that had like every type of food you could possibly imagine from every country and a McDonald's, interestingly enough. Um, so I remember all of those things. I remember, you know, the day we went to get all of our gear and, you know, you're packing it in a, um, duffel bag and picking out your uniforms and things. And that was, that was pretty amazing. We had a spare with us, um, who was Sarah Her Smith. And I ended up giving her like half of my gear, um, because they don't give spares the gear. So I kind of shared that with her and that was fun to do. Um, and then lastly, I guess one of the memories I always talk about is I went to a sports illustrated party, um, you know, the last week. And that, that was like my one night is like, uh, feeling like, like a rock star, you know, like being there with all the really famous athletes at this like amazing club that had like a swimming pool in the middle of it. And the synchronized swimming team performed halfway through the night and just being there with, with everybody, um, that had competed and literally being there until I think about seven o'clock in the morning. Um, that's, that's kind of one story I like to relay because it's like, you know, like I said, the one time you kind of feel like you partied like a rock star, right? <laughs> yeah. So I think, I mean, I echo all those things the, you know, the Olympic village, everything was in there, the sports illustrated parties, you know, both games. One of the things for me was, um, after the Olympics, I got tapped to, um, help run the New York city Olympic bid for 2012. And we put together a family of Olympians. We had two to 3,000 Olympians, you know, American and foreign, who were all supporting the New York Olympic bid. And, you know, so I was on the executive committee of NYC 2012, and that was just an amazing experience, you know, in so many ways. And I actually went to Athens as a, an ambassador for the NYC 2020, so uh, 2012. So I was, you know, I came to the venue and, you know, was out meeting with IOC members and that kind of thing. So that was a big perk. Um, you know, one, one last thing, um, any, any sort of behind the scenes anecdotes, I have one and it, it sort of ties it back to Columbia, but do you have any, any, any sort of behind the scenes anecdotes on any, anything related to rowing in your experience? Oh, goodness. I don't, I mean, I don't know. Uh, why don't you go ahead with yours? Well, so I'm not... <laughs> mine was my first trip to, to Europe, right? So we went to row at, at, at Henley going to the Lucerne Regatta. And we're there with the national team and we're doing this training run and you're out in the water. And so our coach says, hey, Tom, there's Judge Roy. He's a member of the NRF and he's a big Columbia guy. Of course, I knew you know, the, the name Judge Roy. So Judge Roy was in the 29 Columbia crew that won the IRAs. So he says, the coach says to Coxon, take the boat over all the guys. And Judge Roy is on this balcony overlooking the, the Thames River. So take him over. So the coxswain rows us over. We come under the balcony and I said, Judge Roy, Judge Roy, I'm Tom Off. I rode at Columbia for Joe Wilhelm. And he, you know, as an older guy, Lisa says, what did you say? I said, I'm Tom Off, I'm Tom Off. I rode for Joe Wilhelm at Columbia. And he, his, he gets up and he says, so what? <laughs> <laughs> so that was sort of funny. Um, so it was great. I think we're coming to the end of our time. And it was great to see you, Stace. Really great fantastic. To see you too. Yeah, it was really fun talking. And 
Uh, it would be nice to see you, and maybe we can even go for a row and a double. I have, I've got a couple of kids now, three actually, three kids, and I have them rowing. I have uh -huh. three as well. I have not, well, I have not had them rowing. We're we're gonna get there pretty soon. They're twelve and ten, so we're we're gonna move that way. <laughs> That's good. So it was really great talking to you. It's been a long time. It's you too. I hope, I hope to see you soon. Yeah. Yeah. You too. Take care. Take care, Stacey. Bye. Bye.